I do. Do as I do. Come on over. Come on, everybody. Come on over. I'm just going to make a very quick introduction. Give you guys a, a second to figure your levels. Oh, Steve, yay. It's going to be on the fly. Let me know when you all are running. Are you rolling? Okay. Uh, thank you all for coming today. This afternoon, we are. Uh, I'm Leslie Page with Citizens Against Government Waste, and I'm standing in for my boss, Tom Schatz, who is trapped in a hearing room uh, in the Rules Committee, still testifying on uh, what we think is going to be the an attempt to return to earmarking, which is a huge problem. I'm not going to waste any time because I know there's votes going on, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Representative Tom McClintock of California, and then we're going to go through the rest of the folks that are here today and let everyone have a, a stab at talking about this. We are facing an oncoming train, um, and we need to uh, we're going to need to rally a lot of resources and um, and energy to beat back this attempt. But I will let the, the congressman start this ball rolling, and then we'll go from there. Thank well, you and welcome. Come thank you very coming. much. I'm, I'm very pleased and honored to stand by CAGW and the American people in opposing a monumentally bad idea uh, that would return uh, Congress to the bad old days of earmarks. You know, Congress's dysfunction isn't for lack of earmarks. Uh, the House has just concluded one of its most prolific legislative years ever. Um, our Constitution is based on a separation of powers. One branch writes law, but cannot enforce it. Uh, the other enforces law, but cannot write it. Uh, one uh, branch declares war, but cannot wage it. The other branch wages war, but cannot declare it. And one branch appropriates money, but cannot spend it. The other spends money, but cannot appropriate it. Earmarks destroy the fiscal checks and balances. They're a fundamental reversal of the constitutional principle that dates back to the Magna Carta, that the executive cannot spend money until the people appropriate it. That's Article I, Section 9 of our Constitution. No money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law. Drawing money from the Treasury is the executive's function. Appropriating it is the Congress's function. Earmarks blend those two together and end up putting the same pow two powers in the same hands. Earmarks appropriate and spend. And there's a reason for our constitutional checks and balances. They protect against corruption and abuse of power. They assure merit-based and open contracts. And they protect a central tenet of federalism, that local projects should be financed locally and national funds reserved for the general welfare of the entire nation. Let me address one other argument we're hearing from the proponents of bringing back earmarks. It said, well, this will at least help break up the gridlock in, in Congress. Well, as I said, the House is bound by the earmarks ban, and there's been no gridlock in the House. We've had one of our most prolific years in the history of the House of Representatives. Um, but let's look at the heart of that argument, because I think it is the very crux of the problem. At the heart of that argument is the recognition that if you add a few local projects of importance to a member, a bill that he would never vote for on its merits becomes a local imperative that overrides his sound judgment. How does enticing members to vote for legislation that their own judgment rejects promote good public policy? You know, we've heard this siren song before, and it didn't end well. We don't need to repeat a mistake. You're here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Mr. McClintock, for your wise words. Um, I want to go a little out of order here because we have some people coming and going. I will say that having watched this for two days, I was not in the room as some people have been. Uh, I watched both days, most of it, and um, it seemed like for two days straight now we've been hearing members of Congress from both sides of the aisle discuss how dysfunctional the body is. Uh, and I don't think there'd be any disagreement in this room that, the, that the, <laughs> it's not functioning as it should. It's been broken for many years. Uh, and if they think that the solution to that problem is to jump to earmark, you know, and bringing back earmarks and that they can do it well or do it correctly, uh, I think they're sadly mistaken. Uh, uh, <laughs> I've got a lot of pent up emotions about having watched it for two days. Um, I want to introduce Steve Ellis from Taxpayers for Common Sense because he was in the room and did a wonderful job today. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Leslie. 
Thank you, Congressman Clintock. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, so I was uh, in the room for three hours of uh, discussion about bringing back earmarks. I'm Steve Ellis, I'm Vice President of Taxpayers for Common Sense. We're a national nonpartisan budget watchdog. And we, along with CHW, has been doing it longer than we've been around, have been, uh, did database tens of thousands of earmarks. And so we saw all the, uh, the, the problems and the, and the troubles that they create. And to the point about how this would seem to make government work better, I would point out that the last time that um, uh, they passed all of the spending bills uh, individually and on time was in 1994, well before the huge earmark boom. According to the Congressional Research Service, in 1996, there were about 3,000 earmarks. In 2005, there were more than 15,000. Even in the last year of earmarks, when their so-called transparency reforms were in place, which weren't altogether transparent, um, there were still 9,000 earmarks. And not to, not to uh, uh, glaze your eyes over with too much about numbers, but we went back and we looked at the 1970 Defense Appropriations Bill. There were a dozen earmarks. We looked at 19, uh, 1980, and there were 62. By 2006, there were more than 2,700 earmarks in the Defense Appropriations Bill. And so this is clearly a problem um, that uh, should be resolved, and we've resolved it in other areas where there had been earmarks. So we've done two Water Resources Development Acts, authorization bills. They came up with a system not to do earmarks. Just two days ago, the House passed the Miscellaneous of Tariff Bill, previously entirely earmarked, 402 to nothing. Uh, so clearly there is a way to go forward, and what the appropriators need to do is to come up with clear, identifiable uh, metrics and measures uh, criteria that, that can allocate the funding on a basis of merit or competition or formula. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, Leslie and happy to answer any questions sure, about sure. the hearing. We'll do a little, we'll do a little Q and A. We'll do a little Q and A as soon as we get everybody up here to do a quick uh, intro to them, to their organization, and to what they do. And just thank you for the shout out. I should say that you know Citizens Against Government Waste has been tracking earmarks and pork. Pork. I know they didn't want to use the word in the room, but it is pork. They didn't they didn't even want to use earmark, yes, the E word. Yeah, congressionally directed spending, um, which is just another euphemism, and as Steve very astutely pointed out, you can't just change the name and think it's going to work. But anyway, we've been working on this issue since 1991. We've had, we do a, a, an annual compendium of these projects called the Pig Book. Anyone can go to our website and see it. Uh, other groups here, including TCS, and I believe Heritage has also had some uh, lists, and maybe even NTU. We've 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 been looking at this for a long time. This is not a surprise. It's not. It didn't come out of the blue. Um, it's it's a scourge. People went to jail for it, um, but they keep saying that they can do it right this time. Um, huge doubts on that. Okay, so let me stop talking. Uh, Pete Sepp from National Taxpayers Union. Thank you for coming. Again, that's Pete Sepp, president of National Taxpayers Union. You can find more information about us at ntu.org. I'd like to welcome everyone to what ought to be the least necessary news conference of 2018, but here we are. Here we are talking again about a bad budgetary habit that we had hoped Congress had banished but just can't seem to kick. This habit is based on a lot of myths and these myths come up in the hearings that Steve attended and in the talking points of members of Congress, and yet Congress's own research service provides refutation of every one of the points being made right now that earmarks will improve the budget process. Here's Exhibit 1. This is a study CRS did of earmarks and appropriation acts over a 10-year period, 1994 through fiscal year 2005. And this goes right to the heart of the argument that, well, only 1% of federal spending was ever earmarked at its height. And why worry about it? Well, here's why you worry about it. When you take out entitlements, the mandatory items, when you take out the fact that several of the appropriations bills didn't really need earmarks because money was going to contractors anyway, it wasn't necessary. Take a look at the foreign operations bill or the commerce bill. You'll find that 20 to 50 percent of the spending in these bills in some years was earmarked. That's hijacking good budgeting. Here's another exhibit from CRS, continuing resolutions. We like to hear that earmarks sort of greased the skids for a smooth budget process and the passage 
of appropriation bills. Well, there have only been four years in the period of time between uh, 1977 and 2016 when all of the appropriations bills were enacted on time. Yes, four of those occurred during the period when earmarking was prevalent. Uh, what about the other 29 years when earmarking was in existence? They didn't pass them on time. It was rife with squabbles and continuing resolutions. Earmarking does not grease the skids for the passage of appropriation bills. Others argue, well, earmarking can stop gridlock, prevent government shutdowns. Well, there have been 18 funding interruptions since the modern budget era began in the mid-1970s. Three of them resulted in shutdowns. Two of those shutdowns occurred during the era of earmarking. Again, no evidence that earmarking is making the budget process work better, nor that it would make it work better now. Essentially, as far as taxpayers are concerned, the emperor has no clothes here. This is all really about naked political ambition, bringing back a process that does not serve taxpayers well, but serves politicians quite well. Earmarking is not about coming to a budgetary consensus. It is about buying silence, a cynical silence. Taxpayers know when they're being bamboozled, and it's happening now. They're not going to stand for it. So thank you very much. Thanks, Pete. Thank you very much for everything. And I want to recognize Ted Budd, uh, Congressman, and come on up to the podium, And because well, I know you all are Russian. That's right. Well, there's uh, a lot of reasons that voters sent us up here at cutting taxes, repealing Obamacare, uh, and securing the border, all very relevant issues. But I know that one reason they did not send me up here, and that is to bring back earmarks. So I vowed to tackle the reckless spending that has gone on for way too long in Washington, and they sent me here for just that. I do not want to borrow on the backs of future generations, uh, just so that a select few members up here can bring back pork to their districts back home. And the 2016 election really, really showed us exactly that. They demanded a change, but the change that they did not want was to bring back earmarks. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Congress. I'm Tom Schatz, uh, President of Citizens Against Government Waste. I just came from a, the same very lengthy hearing at which uh, Steve Ellis testified before the Rules Committee on Earmarks. Uh, they did listen. Hopefully they listened more closely to us than the members of Congress yesterday who kept saying we need earmarks to get things done. So I will turn this over to uh, my colleagues from the groups that we have worked with for many, many years and, and very much appreciate uh, uh, their support. Adam Brandon, President of Freedom Works. Thanks very much. And I wanted to echo something that, that Pete said. I can't believe we're talking about this. This is unbelievable. Uh, the GOP, its brand is about growth and spending restraint. And I can't think of much you could do worse to, to destroy the, the brand right now. Earmarks are the currency of the swamp. And we're here to drain the swamp. So this is not only just bad policy, this is very bad PR. And I'll be very clear that earmarks are the best GOP voter suppression device that exists. Thank you. <laughs> uh, David Williams, president of the Taxpayer Protection Alliance. Thanks, Tom. As, uh, as Tom mentioned, uh, David Williams with the Taxpayers Protection Alliance. I've been researching and uncovering these uncovering earmarks for 25 years. So I've been doing this a very, very long time. You know, we've heard a lot of uh, information here, but earmarking is an irresponsible way to allocate funds. And Citizens Against Government Waste has some really good information about how the lion's share of these earmarks go to appropriators. This is not a competitive process. Well, it's competitive because the uh, appropriators get inside these meetings and compete for the earmarks. But there's no real competition. As we've heard, earmarks don't help pass budgets. In seven of the 10 years prior to the ban, less than 10% of appropriations bills were enacted on time. Earmarks create chaos. Think about this for a second. Think about transportation projects. With earmarks, you have 
535 secretaries of transportation because each member of Congress is trying to vie for that transportation project in their district. And this creates absolute chaos in the uh, appropriations process. Now, some new members may forget, but members of Congress have gone to jail because of earmarks. A lobbyist went to jail because of earmarks. Is this what they want to bring back? Is this their legacy, the one thing that sent members of Congress and a lobbyist to jail? This is the history of earmarks. A lot of these funding projects are not national priorities. Now, Citizens Against Government Waste has a database of tens, hundreds of thousands of these earmarks. Let's just pick a few. $50 million for an indoor rainforest in Iowa. Think about that for a second. A rainforest indoors, not outdoors, because that's been done before. $50,000 to study mariachi music in Nevada. That was Harry Reid, Senator Harry Reid. And my favorite of all time, and when I say favorite, I think you know what I'm talking about. $100,000 to the Tiger Woods Foundation. Tiger Woods, one of the richest people ever, received an earmark from federal taxpayers. How are we going to let that happen again? We are absolutely not. So it's time to put our foot down collectively and say, no more earmarks. No more going back to the irresponsible way of budgeting. And let's be honest, earmarks are still here. They just, since they don't call them earmarks, they don't have to put their names next to them. Steve and I go through the defense bill every year. There are billions of dollars for earmarks, whether it's an added F-35, whether it's research that nobody wants. Oh, and just in the defense bill, that's where Randy Duke Cunningham, who went to jail, hit his earmarks. And this is what happens. This is the, the effect it has on the budgeting process. This will not grease the skids. This will not help Washington get back together. It will divide Washington even more. And guess what? The bridge to nowhere, that was just the beginning in 2006. Because people saw it in 2006 for what it was. And they see it now. If you're going to drain the swamp, you've got to drain the earmarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, we now have Congressman uh, Jim Banks of Indiana. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. We're in between votes, so I'll be very brief. And you've already heard a lot of good reasons already why we should be opposed to earmarks. I've never seen an earmark, never voted for an earmark, was elected to Congress after earmarks were banned. Uh, but I was on, I, I was elected last year. My name was on the ballot last uh, last uh, November of, of um, a little over a year ago. And I know the voters spoke loud and clear when the, and what they meant by draining the swamp is the opposite, is, is antithetical to bringing back earmarks in this Congress. So I will do what I can as a new member of Congress, along with a number of other conservatives who are determined to make sure that earmarks are buried once and for all, that don't see the light of day in this Congress, and, and look forward to joining the groups that are represented here and, and, and the fight uh, that lies before us to make sure that that happens. So thanks for, uh, thanks for all of your hard work, and uh, sorry to be brief, but I got to go vote, which is what they pay me to do. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, next, we have uh, Mike Needham, the CEO of Heritage Action for America. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, citizens for against government waste for <laughs> against that they're upstairs. Uh, look, bringing back earmarks is beyond a stupid idea. Uh, it is an affront to the voters who felt after the 2016 election that this might be the chance that the swamp would be drained, uh, and that's why we are proud to stand alongside these members of Congress: Congressman McClintock, Bud Banks. Uh, there was a phenomenal op-ed by Congressman Mark Walker of the Republican Study Committee and the Wall Street Journal, Mark Meadows, so many others uh, who are going to hold the line against earmarks. In 2006, the last time Republicans lost the House of Representatives, all of us on the center-right um, side of the aisle heard week in and week out that the voters were sick of the corruption and cronyism exemplified by the types of earmarks that have been talked about today. If earmarks are brought back, this will be an albatross that the Republican Party carries into the 2018 election and beyond. Thank you, Tom, for posting this. Thank you all for being here.
Uh, I would just like to add quickly to uh, what Michael just said. Uh, when Nancy Pelosi said the <coughs> Democrats were going to take back the House in 2006, she said she was going to get rid of the Republican culture of corruption and drain the swamp. Just thought I'd throw that in. So that expression has been around. It's been used on both sides. But there's nothing swampier. I know that's not good English than, than earmarks. Uh, Rachel Slobodian, the Communications Director for Club for Growth. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Congressman, for being here. I'm Rachel Slobodian, Communications Director at Club for Growth. And honestly, it's a little bit like we're living in an alternate universe right now. The fact that we're having this conversation about earmarks when par a big part of the reason that Republicans won the majority in 2010 was because of their promise to ban earmarks. Yet here we are. And we said it before, and I'll say it again. If Republicans move forward with this plan to restore earmarks, it will virtually guarantee loss of the House. And so what we're calling on, supposing that the conference does move forward, we ask that the vote be made public so we know exactly who was responsible for costing Republicans the House. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Jonathan uh, Bidlack, who is uh, the president of the Coalition to Reduce Spending. Thanks, Tom, and thanks for uh, CAGW for putting this together. Uh, not a whole lot more to say. Um, I'm the founder and president of the Coalition to Reduce Spending. Uh, as such, I represent taxpayers from across the nation who want government to spend less, who want to deal with our debt, and reform major programs before it's too late. Uh, Reinstituting earmarks is the wrong way to address these problems, and indeed, it's a step in the opposite direction. Now, it's true, um, as 32 taxpayer groups, many of whom uh, are, are here today, uh, wrote to Congress recently, earmarks are not the sole source of our fiscal problems. Uh, they may not even have been a, 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 the majority of the federal budget, um, and rolling them back didn't necessarily uh, resolve our nation's addiction to overspending. But the primary problem with them remains as true today as in 2011 is when they were banned. They encourage waste on the dubious assumption that trading pet projects will help pass better legislation. Recent and historical experience suggests that greasing the wheels of government with waste is a flawed solution at best. Supporters of earmarks often state that they're a helpful tool to get important projects funded quickly. And no doubt, just like any law, you can find someone who's helped by it. But the question of policy is whether the benefits outweigh the costs. And in the case of earmarks, the answer is a quite resounding no. Studies have shown that when earmarks were part of the process, congressional leadership regularly provided extra spending not based on need, but on how much of a re-election challenge particular members were facing, and that the number of earmarks given to a state skyrocketed by 50% when one of that state's members became chair of a powerful committee. There is virtually no reason to believe that the same phenomena would not occur if earmarks were brought back from their well-deserved death. We realize there's much work to be done to, bring, to return Congress to regular order and to pass meaningful reforms, and that it can be tempting to seek any solution to the epidemic of dysfunction and gridlock. But on behalf of these 32 organizations and the millions of members we represent, we urge you not to return to one of the clearest examples of broken government in our history. Thank you very much. And now we have uh, Wes Denton, who's a spokesman, or the spokesman for the Conservative Partnership Institute. Hi, Wesley Denton with the Conservative Partnership Institute. Uh, really happy to be here, see some uh, good friends and old faces here, is kind of getting the band back together. Um, <laughs> I was a staffer on the Hill uh, for about 12 years, uh, and I worked with earmarking offices and committees and recovering earmarking offices. And uh, I can tell you uh, with experience something that I think is probably part of the, should be part of the conversation right now, and I think one of the congressmen mentioned it earlier, uh, that many of the members of Congress here have not lived under the earmark system. And they don't know the pressures and the corruption and the waste and all of the things. It seems like such a distant memory, but they need to be reminded. Earmarks are why we got massive increases in federal spending. Earmarks are the reason Medicare Part D vote was held open for three hours and members' arms were twisted to vote for a bill they did not want to vote for, but they felt compelled to or lose federal spending in their state. Earmarks are how the bailouts failed the first time, but they added earmarks to the bailouts and they passed the next time. Earmarks are how they passed Obamacare. And then earmarks were also the reason for the Tea Party movement in 2010 that saw the historic election of Republicans and conservatives to Congress. And it was no coincidence that the very next year after they banned, they banned earmarks in 2010, right after the election, 
the very next year, we had a national conversation about debt and spending, and we passed historic budget cuts in the Budget Control Act. And lo and behold, the very same time they're looking to remove those budget caps, to remove those historic conservative victories in, in limiting the spending of government, they're also saying, look, we're not just going to get rid of the budget caps that, we, uh, that were won after earmarks were banned. We're going to bring earmarks back to sweeten the pot. And I, I think these offices uh, have not lived under a regime where they think right now bringing earmarks back may just help some spending their state. What earmarks actually do is turn every single debate that comes before Congress into an earmark discussion. So this DACA conversation that we're having, whether you're on the on pro uh, DACA amnesty or against it, added to that conversation would be whether you want to keep funding for your state or they needed to buy votes uh, with a new earmark that to waste taxpayer funding to get votes for the bill. It adds a, a dimension to these bills and the pressure to these offices and to these members they haven't seen before. And I think they need to take a warning from those who lived under the regime uh, that the pressures, earmarks are not used to take conservative policies over the finish line. Earmarks are used to grow government, to buy votes for bad liberal policies, and conservatives are united, and I think you can tell from that in this room, we are united in opposing bringing back the earmark favor factory, and they should keep it closed for business. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wesley. I want to add one other point to uh, what Leslie just said in terms of the new members. Uh, they may be hearing that they're going to get their fair share of earmarks. This is a great system. It'll work well. In the 111th Congress, when the names of members of Congress were included at the back of each appropriations bill, the 81 House and Senate appropriators, who constituted 15 percent of the 535 members of Congress, got 51 percent of the earmarks and 61 percent of the money. So there is no equity in earmarks. And there is no way to make it fair, and there is, it's simply a huge political and strategic mistake. And the Senate's already said, Senate Republicans agreed unanimously January 17th, almost exactly a year ago, that they would not bring back earmarks. They agreed to extend the moratorium. So even if the House does something and changes its rules in the middle of a Congress, which is strange enough in and of itself just for earmarks, then what happens when they pass bills and they go to the Senate? Uh, they passed all 12 appropriations bills in the House last year without earmarks. They had the Water Resources uh, and Reform Development Act, the WERDA Act in 2014. It said no earmarks. So they are addressing through the authorization process issues related to how money is distributed throughout the country, and that's the way to get this done. More oversight, more authorizations. There's $310 billion in unauthorized programs, some of which haven't been reauthorized for 30 years. That's where Congress should be doing its quote unquote Article I constitutional activity. Open up for questions. Yes, ma'am. What do you think of President Trump's record in the House? I think the President likes to get things done. Uh, I think that he may view it as a way to help move things along. We're trying to make sure that everyone understands that that simply isn't the case. Uh, the, honestly, the President was not here either when earmarks were uh, being used. And when people just look at what might be out there in the press, they may hear from members who say, we'd like earmarks back, that may be the impression. And again, it's not just true of the president. It's true of this two-thirds of Congress that, hasn't, that was elected after earmarks came in, uh, excuse me, after the earmark moratorium. Uh, there have been discussions about the fact that a majority of the Republican conference might vote to bring back earmarks. So that honestly has nothing to do with President Trump. I don't think it'll have any impact because it was already being discussed. Absolutely not. If it does, it's going to be more expensive, and the money's going to go to the people that write those bills, who are the appropriators, because they literally sit in these tiny rooms, much smaller than this, and they put little stickies on the bills, they handwrite projects that have not been considered by the House or the Senate. Uh, in the 2006 uh, appropriations bills, the Department of Transportation Inspector General did an analysis. It's a very instructive report, September 2007. I encourage people to look at this. 99% of the earmarks were added in conference for three major Department of Transportation agencies. And in some cases, 100% of the projects inside some of those programs were earmarked, which means they all went around the planning process that was being done at the local level by the metropolitan planning organizations, the states, back up to DOT, so members went around that process. And there have been legis been legislation introduced to limit it to the 
Bureau of Reclamation and the Army Corps of Engineers, it will never be limited if it comes back. It will cover absolutely everything as it used to do. Yes, sir. Um, so Anyone else can come up and talk too. Paul has already said that he's not in town today. He was going to go back to town and speak with us later in the morning. I was kind of surprised. I think the House Republican Conference was kind of last Wednesday. So if Democrats are supposed to have some authority on this, it's not you guys. I mean, so what about this whole thing? I mean, should they even have to be talking to you guys and speak with us and have a discussion with us and make the argument? Well, if they bring back earmarks, it's a good way to almost guarantee the Democrats take control. So uh, I wouldn't go on any presumption one way or another. I would just talk about whether it's good policy or not. I wouldn't worry about the future, and that's one of the reasons that the Rules Committee was holding a hearing to see if there might be some way to address the issue. A lot of the uh, outside groups discuss the idea of greater oversight and authorization. That's really where Congress can decide how the money should be spent, not through the earmark process. And again, I hope members recognize that this is not the way to get things done and that it's not going to be done fairly. Good. I just wanted to, the grassroots are still upset about the failure to get anything done on Obamacare. And then you had a little bit of reprieve with getting a tax bill done. And you could squander all that goodwill with the grassroots by bringing earmarks back, just like that. So that's why we're all here today to say this is a bad idea. And this needs to be the last press conference that we talk about this issue. It just needs to die here today. <laughs> One thing, you know, what you've heard from some of the people saying this just needs to be transparent. Well, as somebody who looked at those bills back in 2000, fiscal year 2008, 2009, 2010, it is inherently, it was not transparent then. Those are the rules that would come back into place where you basically just had members' names, the, the earmark and the dollar amount and paper in the back of the committee report. We had to, and CHW and others, had to transcribe that with their separate member request letter to actually find out where the project was actually going to who was actually the, the, the corporate beneficiary in the case of many of the Defense Department earmarks. And so transparency is, is not the solution and a, lot of, and a panacea to this. And also I just point out that 9,000 earmarks by itself is inherently opaque. You just can't, you can't contemplate and actually get your head around all of that. And the Appropriations Committee, quite frankly, can't get their head around all of that. The last year that they had earmarks, they had 30,000, 33,000 requests for earmarks. And so it, 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 this is just an overwhelming, it's literally like drinking out of an information fire hose. Yeah. Just a point of clarification on uh, two of the questions mentioned that President Trump was in support of earmarks. The head of White House Legislative Affairs, Mark Short, has clarified and said that the president has not taken a position on bringing about back earmarks, that he's open to hearing uh, from both sides on the issue. And I think we need to recognize that he had just spent a weekend in Camp David with congressional leaders uh, who have been hoping to bring back earmarks for some time. And on the point about uh, Democrats coming back and whether they would bring back earmarks, I would point out that we actually instituted earmark reforms once Democrats took charge of Congress because this is a divided issue. It, it's not a clear battle lines. We have some allies on both sides of the aisle in this debate. And uh, when I was in the Senate, uh, Senator Jim DeMint sponsored earmark reforms with Barack Obama and Clara McCaskill and others because the, some members on both sides of the aisle see the waste and the corruption, and it's not a given that they would come back. And I think the American people uh, have spoken clearly on this in election after election, and if the Congress, whether it's Republican or Democrat, wants to bring it back and try them out again, I think they'll be surprised for what they hear back home. Uh, joined by Congressman Ralph Norman, uh, very much appreciate your uh, help with uh, getting us together today, and, and thank you for joining us. My honor. Thank you. Thank you for being here. You know, this is such an important topic. This country is $200 trillion in debt. It boils down to $174,351 per taxpayer. Um, you know, when, when earmarks were banned, uh, it was the right thing to do. To not bring it back today is the right thing to do. I went to a rules committee hearing yesterday, and you had a panel of five, four were arguing for earmarks. And the bridge to nowhere came up, which was we all heard about. It was all over the press years ago. Um, and, you know, the, the, the comments were, you know, every bridge starts with nothing in front of it, and you build on that. But I will tell you that we have priorities 
And when you have groups of people, constituents coming, I will tell you that's a priority to them. But uh, that's not the best thing for the country. That's not the best thing for uh, where we are particularly now. To fund teapot museums uh, and to fund non-essential um, items is wrong. And I can easily go back to my constituents and say, you know, I can't do this project. It may make sense. It may get me reelected in your minds, but the, country, the patient has got cancer. The country is the patient. And we've got to get on, the, on a firm financial footing. Putting earmarks in place will not do that. Um, and I think uh, the, the argument that is constitutional, you don't have, we don't have an unlimited right to spend dollars uh, as we see fit. So to me, it's common sense. I will oppose it. And hopefully, it will not gain traction because uh, we've got to get the country back on track. And hopefully, we can do this and turn, turn this thought process to put them back in, um, turn it down. Yes, ma'am. Doing just what you're doing now. Have a go back to your individual districts, get uh, your congressman, get the media, and ask and, and say some of the same things we're saying. And uh, that's the most effective thing. You know, you've got each uh, constituency has got so much power with their congressman because you put them in office and go to them and say, as conservatives, uh, as someone who really wants to get this country uh, healthy again financially. Uh, we don't want to go back to the old ways that got us there in the first place. And again, in, in all of our constituents' minds, their project is the most uh, pressing thing at the time. But uh, it's, it's not in so many cases, particularly when we're $22 trillion in debt. Ed, we all remember our lessons from civics class. Write your uh, congressman, call your congressman, visit your congressman. What they didn't tell us in civics class is, don't write them to, at their office. Write them on the letters to the editor page of the local newspaper or your favorite blog. Call them, but don't call them at the office. Call them when they're on a radio show. Uh, 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 visit them, but don't visit them at their office. Visit them at a public meeting and hold them accountable. Someone who's not afraid of town meetings, apparently. <laughs> Other questions? Well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Thank you, uh, our, our good friends and, and colleagues in this effort. And uh, as Adam pointed out, uh, let's not say once again, here we are again. Also, Americans for Tax Reform is represented today. I just want to make sure that's mentioned as well. Olivia is here. So uh, again, a very, very good, comprehensive group of organizations that have been doing this for a long time. Please read my 30-page remarks with 112 footnotes. You'll know everything you need to know and more about earmarks. Thank you. Thank you.